Uh, we're up to number five. The, what I call the critique of enlightenment, and it's going to focus on romanticism and that German expression of romanticism called Sturm und Drang, storm and stress, uh, which was popular in, the, in, in Weimar Germany, and, and, and we'll, we'll get to that soon enough. So here we are, and the points of criticism that this opposition movement, it's not a singular movement, it's, it's a group that, that criticize enlightenment assumptions from an, a number of different directions, but the following enlightenment assumptions were aspects of the what I've been arguing through the first four sessions, were an integrated, a single integrated worldview or climate of opinion that was shared across the entire social class of enlightenment figures. And the criticisms uh, were, you could group them around specific elements of that shared integrated view. The first one that I wanna talk about is, or, or that we'll mention and we'll see how they go about criticizing it, is that they see history as an inevitable progression, the march of progress. So a couple of components of this or corollaries of this is that modernity is really preferable to what they would have thought of as the primitive and particularly the medieval. Uh, the world gets better every day in every way. Uh, another aspect of that is that art and artifice is an improvement on raw nature. And we'll see how the defenders of nature will, will take issue with this, with this, what they will consider a blind assumption. The second point is that science is the optimal framework for understanding the world. And this rests on the deeper assumption that the universe is a machine which can be methodically explained and that this extends to human behavior and, and the human personality, that people can be examined uh, as one could examine a machine using the same techniques and methodologies. And the third assumption is that rationality is really at the center or essence of human nature. And as such, man is perfectible because history is a progressive movement and because man is something akin to the machine of the universe. So, so deep down, the universe is a rational uh, enterprise and that man is a product of the universe and is at heart a rational being. Uh, the first and greatest critic is this iconoclast, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who is simultaneously one of the leading lights of the Renaissance, one of the leading philosophers in Paris, and its major critic. He is this perfect contradiction, and he was an extraordinary personality, uh, an eminent philosopher, a major novelist. His novel, Julie, or the New Eloise, we'll take a peek at in a slide or two. He was an educational theorist in his great influential book, a book that sold more than virtually any other book in the 18th century, The Emile, or On Education, as it was called. He's an autobiographer, the first of the great modern confessional autobiographies, which is really worth the read. If you're going to do a history of the autobiography, I suppose you go from uh, St. Augustine and you leap right to Rousseau before you move into the 19th century. He's a musicologist and a major contributor to uh, the encyclopedia with articles largely on music and musicology, not exclusively. 
And he's arguably the first uh, significant romantic, uh, intellectual romantic, and we'll explore what we mean by that. So he's clearly the most intriguing figure, intellectual figure of the 18th century. He was a darling of the philosophes, and he's their major scourge and critic. So I point out here that he had authored 31 articles in the encyclopedia, uh, mostly on music, but a couple on, on politics. And he was the most sought after star of the salons. Uh, he cherished uh, some enlightenment opinions and attacked others. He picked feuds with David Hume. He picked feuds with uh, Voltaire, which was considered out of bounds. The godfather himself was to be criticized by the young upstart here. Uh, but he was all these things. And I want to look at some of the objections he had to Enlightenment assumptions. And I'm going to do it by just mentioning a series of uh, significant works from early in his life to later in his life, all of which uh, are part of the great canon of, of sort of Western, certainly French must reads. And the first one, there, there were two discourses. The first discourse on the moral effects of the arts and sciences he wrote in 1750. And it's a direct assault on the vaunted improvements of modern civilization, which he characterizes as a corrupter of human nature. Modern civilization is the source of corruption, not the improvement over the state of nature. And this quote, before art had molded our behavior and taught our passions to speak an artificial language. And here for the first time, art of the, the term artificial is being used with negative connotation. Our morals were rude on form, but natural. Human nature was not at bottom better then than now, but men found their security in the ease with which they could see through one another. And this advantage of which we no longer feel the value prevented their having many vices. So people didn't have the trappings of civilization. Uh, and so society was not devious and veiled and, and human passions and emotion uh, could more naively shine through. It wasn't covered in artifice. In our day, he says, now that more subtle study and a more refined taste have reduced the art of pleasing to a system where we're practiced in, 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 in our deceptiveness. There prevails in modern manners a servile and deceptive conformity. Politeness requires this thing, decorum that thing. Ceremony has its forms and fashion its laws. And these we must always follow, never the promptings of our own nature. We are being unnatural. We are following the social mores of convention and convention is corrupting. Our minds have been corrupted in proportion as the arts and sciences have improved. So the first salvo, Modern civilization has corrupted us, not improved us. And then four years later, he writes the second discourse, which establishes his popularity on the origin of the inequality of mankind. Inequality. Having been roundly criticized for the first discourse, Rousseau now takes on the philosophical underpinning of Enlightenment liberalism, which was Locke's state of nature and the idea of property. He goes head, at, head on at the established gods of, of Enlightenment assumptions. And his version of the state of nature comes out this way. The first man who, after enclosing a piece of ground, took it into his head to say, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the true founder of civil society. How many crimes 
how many wars, how many murders, how many misfortunes and horrors would that man have saved the human species who pulling up the stakes or filling up the ditches should have cried to his fellows, be sure not to listen to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits of the earth belong equally to us all and the earth itself to nobody. So the establishment of private property is the beginning of the downfall because it is the beginning of uh, inequality and the devious uh, comparisons uh, that rest on this. And we'll see what he says to that effect. So still looking at the uh, discourse on inequality, the simple life of the state of nature is preferable to civilization because in nature, there is no inequality of property. The example of the savages, most of whom have been found in this condition, seems to confirm that mankind was formed ever to remain in it, that this condition is the real youth of the world, and that all ulterior improvements have been so many steps in appearance towards the perfection of individuals, but in fact, towards the decrepitness of the species. As long as men remain satisfied with their rustic cabins, as long as they confined, confined themselves to the use of clothes made of the skins of other animals, in a word, as long as they undertook such works only as a single person could finish, work that, that you could, without a complex society, achieve the final product of, in other words, simple work, and stuck to such arts as did not require the joint endeavors of several hands. They lived free, healthy, honest, and happy, as much as their nature would admit, and continued to enjoy with each other all the pleasures of an independent intercourse. But from the moment one man began to stand in need of another's assistance, meaning industry and complex society. From the moment it appeared an advantage for one man to possess the quantity of provisions requisite for two, not to mention for a billion, all equality vanished. Property started up, labor became necessary, and boundless forests became smiling fields, which it was found uh, necessary to water with human sweat and in which slavery and misery were soon seen to sprout out and grow with the fruits of the earth. In his writings here and in other places, Rousseau uses two terms that both mean in a kind of literal sense, self-love. He distinguishes between the two. Uh, I'll start with the bottom one in that little box in the bottom of the page, what he calls amour de soi. That love of self is the term he uses to describe the healthy regard for oneself that is merited by a simple life in the world, that does not take into account what others think of you, that doesn't take into account the judgmental um, character of a complex society. It's the love of self without, in that uh, utterly American phrase, without the mean girls doing their chorus in the background. Amour propre is the term he uses to refer to the esteem and approval that comes from others. It results from civilization with its inequality, unhealthy competition, and individual unhappiness. It's the measure, the proprietary measure that people take. Mine is bigger than yours. I have more than you, uh, which, of course, is the source of an endless rat race, an endless uh, movement towards an extremes of inequality, and what he will argue is ultimately individual unhappiness. And in a very modern 
sense alienation that the individual has in the context of the larger society that they're in. Uh, the, 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 before the existentialists of the 20th century, Rousseau was describing the alienation of the individual. So he premises this on the issue of desire, which is fostered by amour propre and happiness. Addiction, the, the ultimate weakness in the pursuit of property and, and, and competitiveness uh, is desire. It's, a, it's an addiction. It's the ultimate, it's the ultimate tendency of feeding the beast, what you wind up with feeding the beast. It's what Plato talks about when he says uh, the unreflected life, the life of the appetite leads towards tyranny, the tyranny of the soul. The soul's been eaten alive. It's out of balance. The, the, the appetitive, greedy, grasping part of the self, instead of, instead of being in a healthy balance and, and ruled, as Plato would have had it, by, by a, a rational, reflective element in the soul, the conscious element, uh, it's out of control. And, and, and its expression in, in the social world is, is of the tyrant, the bully, um, the, the ultimate consumer, the addict. For Rousseau, modern society breeds psychological discontent by creating desires that are not fulfillable. The individual is placed in a life of rivalry, competition, and acquisition, but is told that virtue is none of those things. Virtue is about self-sacrifice and the suppression of appetite. So modern society is this, this trap, this box for him that we built for ourselves. You're, you're told, get yours, pursue, achieve, compete, desire, taste. But virtue is self-sacrifice and the suppression of that appetite. So you're, you're caught, pulled, and pushed in two different directions. Happiness and contentment are not achievable for him in a world that sends conflicting messages. Compete and accumulate, but sacrifice for the common good. Thus, modern life, and this is why I italicized that, that term in that second paragraph there, is structurally frustrating. It's built to be frustrating. And consequently, it's alienating. You're the individual alienated by the context, the box that you find yourself in. So the individual who's now a dependent addict always feels thwarted. And Rousseau was very much this moody, emotional, when you read the autobiography, or if you read any of the commentary of his friends and associates, uh, David Hume, was quite enlightening on, on the problem of Rousseau. Here was this chronically unhappy person who felt thwarted by the world he found himself in. He offers solutions. He presents two ways in which this problem can be addressed, in which frustration can be avoided, and therefore individual happiness can be achieved. Now, these two ways... Uh, neither of which, when, when we take a closer look, might be uh, possible, or certainly no more possible than the, um, the philosopher king of, of Plato's model. But the two ways are, and, and, and I'll simply characterize them before I look at these paragraphs with you, are either you create a society in which individual uh, property achievement reward are entirely suppressed 
for the public good. So you have, for the common good. So you have a, a model not unlike that of ancient Sparta, where virtually no one had ed- anything and everything was done for the state. Or, or the early Roman Republic in its idealized form, where, where the heroes are people who, you know, leave the plow and go into battle with, you know, for the state. The, 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 the Romans used to tell stories about their early Republican heroes that, that sound, they, they were superheroes. They were the stories of people like Mucha Scaivola when the Etruscans were marching on Rome. He's from the very early Republican period. And, and he is caught attempting to sneak into the Etruscan camp. And he's brought before the Etruscan king who, who questions him and says, what are you about? And Scavola, according to the legend, sticks his hand in the campfire. And while it burns, he announces to the Etruscan king, there are 300 more like me, Roman citizens, coming to kill you. And and this ideal of I am worth only if the collective is worth something. Everything is sublimated into the collective. So, number one. His first option is create a society in which individual individual desires are not allowed to get out of hand. That is a society where all individual desires are transferred onto the common good. And and as I said, Sparta, the Roman Republic, and Plato's idealized social order uh, that, that he models in the Republic serve as models. This is addressed in his book, which he writes in 1762, his famous social contract. And and it looks as otherworldly and as unreal uh, to his contemporary audience as I imagine Plato's Republic did to his. The second option that he creates, and he says, now suppose we, we can't do the social contract. You can't orchestrate the world. We're not in that world. What do I do practically in the world in which I find myself? And he says, okay, in that world, create an individual context in the really existing world in which the individual is shielded from corrupting social messages. So what he proposes, and he details this in his famous book, The Emile, or On Education, which is published also in 1762, He was really wrestling with this problem. I mean, two of the biggest books of the 18th century, he publishes the same year. And it's a totally enveloping educational program as could only have been uh, even fantasized about by members of the aristocracy who had the means to create the, the semblance of this world in which the young Emile uh, grows up in a world that has been orchestrated perfectly for him as a child, so that he only experiences restrictions that are dictated by nature, not arbitrary restrictions, no restrictions of the order of you can't do that because I'm Papa or I'm Mama and I said you can, or you can't do that because we don't do that, or you are a bad boy and have violated some some, um, mores or moral principles of the collective. So the kid is is sort of to grow up in a a kind of perfect ideal Montessori universe uh, in which everything has been orchestrated around them. And indeed there were people in the aristocratic class who decided to try to raise uh, children that way, usually with totally disastrous consequences, by the way. But the idea is well taken that that you come down to two choices. Limit the growth of desire collectively. That's number one. That's the social contract. Or create and fulfill only healthy desires. 
there's no competition. Uh, there, there are no other people that you're measuring yourself against. This isn't, oh, little Johnny gets the gold star because little Susie gets a, a black mark. And you have all of the, the unhealthy aspects of that kind of a competition set up. Um, and, and so it's really about the elimination of the frustration in the modern environment that is the result of competitiveness, the experience of limitation, uh, of repression and suppression of desire. The idea would be to form it either socially as a group or ideally to raise the child in, in some kind of supportive structure where everything has been arranged and the lessons that they've learned if there's not a, enough food to eat it isn't because i've taken the food away it's because nature has not provided it okay and it's filled with his advice is filled with examples like that so turning to the social contract first we'll take a little a very short peek at each of these and whether it's even feasible uh, and he talks about what he calls the volant uh, general, the general will. Rousseau first argues that man in the state of nature is free and that no one has the right to control anybody else. Existing societies are conventional constructs that are inherently oppressive in his view. He opens with the famous line, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. One thinks himself the master of others and still remains a greater slave than they. What can make it legitimate? And he goes on. Indeed, if there were no prior convention, social contract, if you will, where, unless the election were unanimous, would be the obligation on the minority to submit to the choice of the majority? How have a hundred men who wish for a master the right to vote on behalf of 10 who do not. The law of majority voting is itself established by convention and presupposes unanimity on one occasion at least, or else there's no justification for civil society. He then proposes the solution of a social compact formed from just such a case, a universal general will, where this unanimity was established. The sum of forces can arise only where several persons come together. But as the force and liberty of each man are the chief instruments of his self-preservation, how can he pledge them without harming his own interests and neglecting the care he owes to himself, the amour de soi? This difficulty may be stated in the following terms. The problem is to find a form of association which will defend and protect with the whole common force, the person and goods of each associate, and in which each, while uniting himself with all, may still obey himself alone and remain as free as before. So the Spartan, who from the outside looks like a soldier in Maoist China, it's the Maoist dream, in effect. If Everybody is in the same boat, and everybody is there as a part of an initial unanimous decision, then it is a form of freedom. No one, no one has taken anything from me. This is the fundamental problem which the social contract tries to provide the solution. The total alienation of each associate the sublimation might be a better word, together with all his rights to the whole community. So only in an egalitarian society will a person be free. Happiness is possible because there is no sense of alienation, no incentive to rivalry, no arbitrary domination, no amor pro. The citizen of an idealized Sparta or Republican Rome cares only for the general good. 
as unlikely a case as this may be. Now, his second alternative version of establishing the sense of freedom is the Emil. Since he, and by the way, the Emil was a bestseller. I mean, it sold as many copies as his novel, The New Eloise, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Since he perceives society as corrupt, Rousseau dispenses with both public education and simply letting the child, lets the child loose in the world. Under existing conditions, a man left to himself from birth would be more of a monster than the rest. So in other words, in society, if you just let the kid, if you just throw him into the street, what you're going to create is a monster because of the, the corrupting influence of that set of social conditions that you're throwing the kid into. Prejudice, authority, necessity, example, all the social conditions into which we are plunged would stifle nature in him and put nothing in her place. So, time for an education. It's got to be orchestrated. One, far from being too strong, children are not strong enough for all the claims of nature. Give them full use of such strength as they have, and they will not abuse it. So, introduce them to it gradually. Two, supply the experience and strength, and strength they lack whenever the need is of the body, whenever it's a physical need. Three, in the help you give them, confine yourself to what is really needful without granting anything to caprice or unreason, for they will not be tormented by caprice if you do not call it into existence, seeing it is in no part of nature. They won't be willful. Don't encourage any kind of willfulness. Four, study carefully their speech and gestures so that at an age when they are incapable of deceit, you may discriminate between those desires which come from nature and those which spring from perversity. Okay? Don't really ride herd on the appetites. The spirit of these rules is to give children more liberty and less power, to let them do more for themselves and demand less of others, so that by teaching them to confine their wishes within the limits of their powers, they will scarcely feel the want of whatever is not in their power. I used to, when I would read uh, a meal with, a, with an undergraduate class, I used to say, you're in a room and you're on one side of a wall and on the other side of the wall, there's no way to get to it. There's no opening. It's just part of the furniture of the place you're in. There's a wall there between you and whatever's on the other side of it. What you don't feel is frustration because you don't have access. It's, it's, it's a given of nature. Here's a wall. However, if there is a door in that wall, and I arbitrarily lock it and do not allow you to go through it, now you're frustrated. Now you are blocking me from getting to the other side of that wall because now it's a dictate not of, of nature anymore and as, as they will perceive it. So the education is to avoid ever creating a sense of arbitrary, arbitrary outside authority. The limits placed on him should be those dictated by the nature of things. The antidote to alienation is a sense of freedom, and this would not be the case in a traditional education. So freedom, interestingly enough, and, and you, we see how he is tending towards what I will call the romantic, uh, Freedom is really about the emotional sense of freedom. It's not about whether or not you have access to an option. It's about whether you have the power to fulfill whatever access you do desire. Does your power meet your desire? If it doesn't, you, you feel frustrated. And I'm free. 
but I want to, I want to, I want to, the kid says. So freedom is about a sense of being treated fairly, a sense of, of being limited only by the confines of the universe, not by any arbitrary social um, limitation placed on you. So this idea of the feeling free. Rousseau gravitates towards the, powerfully towards this idea of authenticity resides in sentiment and sentimentalism as a loose word for a movement, if you will, uh, develops in the second half of the 18th century. And we find it in art and literature and in music. Uh, Rousseau's interest in naturalism and emotional experience become common in this period. The focus is one on personal subjectivity. And that gives rise to themes of, if you look at art and if you look at literature, to themes of passion, loss, inspiration, and impulse. It's an age of new forms which, which batten on these sentiments. The novel, the confessional autobiography, Rousseau's being the benchmark, and melodrama, which, which feed on the emotional life of the subject. In literature, the new sentimentality uh, looks as extreme as the 12th century courtly love movement and its obsession with titillating shades of passion. Rousseau's novel, uh, Julie, ou la nouvelle Eloise, 1761, becomes a public sensation, stirring up a class of, of, of followers, what I call here Parisian boppy soxers. He has, he has uh, fans all over his, his um, readership. And I've, I've stolen this one short uh, passage from Julie. I tremble as often as our hands meet and I know not how it happens, but they meet constantly. I start as soon as I feel the touch of your finger. I am seized with a fever or rather delirium in these sports. My senses gradually forsake me and when I am thus beside myself, what can I say? What can I do? Where hide myself? How be answerable for my behavior? The cup runneth over. We, this is a period of very purple prose. It becomes a, a world in which everything around the individual is seen as and expressed as organic. The universe is now not going to be the machine. It's going to be an organism. Everything is, is going to be about growth and movement and life forces. The idealization of nature was a counterpoint to the vision of the universe as a machine. And all the arts, including landscape design, by the way, nature was presented as organic, a growing sentient thing. It was represented as something transcendent, sublime. It had soul. And so uh, the classical garden, uh, growth is suppressed and shaped and, and, and you're presented with orderly objects, shrubs that have been espaliered and trimmed into a, a perfect, uh, rational symmetry. The romantic garden is going to be quite something else where, where it, it's going to suggest movement and su suggest wildness and, and, and suggest growth. And so we have the, th the theme of sentiment. We have the theme of, of organic nature. And we have the theme of uh, the Middle Ages as our roots the Middle Ages are no longer the Dark Ages. They're no longer going to be ignorant and superstitious. They're going to be magical. They are going to be where we come from. They were 
they're going to be uh, the place that the folk in in and the in Germanic myth first first found themselves. They're reclaimed as a period of sentimental faith and religiosity and passionate heroism. It's El Cid in Roland. Medieval buildings, often mere ruins, were depicted as dripping with mystery, shadowy, dripping with atmosphere, dripping with sentiment, dripping with native charm, dripping with dark secrets, dripping even with Gothic horror. The castle of Otranto, this is the, the period uh, when, when you're set in ruins in Southern Italy and, and, and the first great bodice rippers came off the press. The new style of garden frequently came with spanky new medieval ruins. They would actually construct these follies uh, structures to look like medieval ruins because you want to, wanted to introduce the idea of mystery back into your garden. And finally, the origin stories of your peoples were now presented in the newly resurrected sagas. This is the age for the rediscovery of sagas. In fact, there's a great scandal in the late 18th century. A man named McPherson uh, says he has discovered and translated these Celtic Gaelic sagas uh, of a lost mythic bard called Ashen, and he publishes these. And, and they're taken by Celts and Gaels in, in, in the north of England as, as, as the verification of, of their, you know, of the foundation of their race. And it turns out that that they were uh, totally made up, <laughs> that he was a very clever forger. But there was a great debate in the period about whether these were real or whether they were forgeries. And, and so we are one half step away from Wagnerian opera, which is just around the corner into the 19th century when, when romanticism, as we think about it in music, takes full flight. So one of the great uh, protagonists and authors of, of romantic literature and the, the storm and stress movement is the great, great uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who is born mid-century, but he lives well into the 19th century. He gets into his 80s. He's a poet, he's a dramatist, he's a novelist, he's a travel writer, he's a critic, he's a botanist. He's the most influential writer in the German language ever. His association with the giants of German intellectual life uh, names that we would, if we continued, some of them we'll talk about a little bit today, but if we moved into the 19th century, Schiller and the poet and Fichte and Herder and the Schlegel brothers and Alexander von Humboldt, he's put him, they revolve around him like planets. He's at the center of the German Romantic movement, which was referred to for a reason as Sturm und Drang. He writes a novel that, that becomes a bestseller, and he does it in the 17, early 1770s, I think it's 1772, when he publishes it at the age of 23 or four, and uh, published soon after Julie, um, within a decade at least, the Werther's Leiden, the sorrows of young Werther, captured the youthful agonies of sentiment, emotion, and passion at the heart of the Sturm und Drang movement with uh, the public sensation created by the novel stokes a youth movement with lovesick readers walking around dressed up in the styles of Werther and his beloved as, as the clothing descriptions. So you have your, your first hippie movement here. And even, even to the extreme of tragic, uh, rejected protagonists committing suicide, there was the spout of, 
uh, youthful suicides for lost loves and, and as a result of uh, the sorrows of Werther. Sometimes I don't understand how another can love her, is allowed to love her, since I love her so completely myself, so intensely, so fully, grasp nothing, know nothing, I have nothing but her. I possess so much, but my love for her absorbs it all. I possess so much, but without her, I have nothing. I suffer much for I have lost the only charm of life, that active sacred power which created worlds around me. It is no more. When I look from my window at the distant hills and behold the morning sun breaking through the mists and illuminating the country around, which is still wrapped in silence, nature, huh? whilst the soft stream winds gently through the willows, which have shed their leaves, when glorious nature displays all her beauties before me, and her wondrous prospects are ineffectual to extract one tear of joy from my withered heart, I feel that in such a moment, I stand like a reprobate before heaven, hardened, insensible, and unmoved. Oftentimes do I then bend my knee to the earth and implore God for the blessing of tears as the desponding laborer in some scorching climate prays for the dews of heaven to moisten his parched corn. So here we, here we have it all. And I, and I love this um, portrait that some of the, I don't even know who did this. I have to go searching for that of the young Goethe because it's such a romanticized picture of him. We have many other portraits of him that are very realistic, but I wanted to include this one because he, he looks like you imagine a Werther would have looked. Um, and of course, it affects graphic art, this, this, this idea that nature is about unleashed force and the emotions inside the human soul are about unleashed forces. It's not about cool, rational, measured control. Uh, it's not the, the, if you will, a reflection of those gardens at Versailles or those Robert Adam buildings, which, which sit in quiet dignity and speak of quiet, rational contemplation, the art in the movement is going to, to move as the literature moved towards, towards the emulation of this storminess of nature. Uh, so here you have natural forces, interior emotions, atmospheric moods, and mystery. And the uh, Claude Vernet in 1767, it's a storm with a shipwreck. And, and here we see nature doing its all and figures in movement and figures being buffeted by the world before them. And, and here is uh, this Caspar David Friedrich, the wanderer above the sea of fog. Here is this mysterious depiction of the self. The, he's not looking towards you, you're him, you're looking through him. And it's and it and it's the self looking at the natural world alone in the natural world, uh, without the trappings of bourgeois society around him, but a person and and the human predicament on the edge of nature. Uh, done in 1818, he had some stuff from in the 18th century, but I wanted to go with this one, and he lives beyond this. And of course, the reconstruction of, uh, or the rehabilitation of the medieval worldview. Medievalism is now again on the menu. Ruins were deliberate allusions to the mystery and emotional faith of the Middle Ages and the pathos of loss and the passing of time. 
So human death is intimated uh, as well as human loss and the experience of the individual in, in the individual's life cycle is, is uh, expressed phylogenetically as well as ontogenetically. It's not only the experience of the individual, it's the experience of the civilization. And here we have this sense of aging in the civilization. So romanticism was closely allied with emerging European nationalism and the cult of the folk. Ruins were the proof and stone of the nation's roots. Here is another of Caspar David Friedrichs, the abbey in the Oakwood. Here there is uh, no human reference, really. You have a cemetery in the foreground. You see the little crucifix. You have uh, the withered trees, uh, the oakwood trees in, I imagine, winter months. It's, it's the desolation of, of, of nature, um, the darkening, lowering sky. And here, and I only chose this J.M.W. Turner. Turner, who's famous for doing all those, you know, the English painter who did all those wonderful oils of, of uh, seascapes where everything is a vertiginous, vertiginous and vertiginous uh, swirl of sky and sea buffeting the insignificant ship that's often in the foreground. But here he does Tintern Abbey and I picked it up because of Wordsworth's fav famous poem about about his, his thoughts while visiting Tintern Abbey and how the medieval ruin, and I believe, by the way, that this painting precedes the Wordsworth poem. I don't know whether Wordsworth ever saw this painting, but he knew Tintern Abbey. And, and its, sense, its sense of the evocativeness of uh, this great abbey church now a dark ruin choir as Shakespeare, where once the sweet birds sang, and here we have it. Now, I didn't know where in this lecture series I should mention a man that you can't avoid mentioning as one of the great minds of the century. And I put him here even though he is, uh, in some senses, a, a traditional rationalist philosopher, I put him here uh, because at the same time, he is somebody who argues for a subjective way of resolving philosophical problems and a critic of all prior theories of how reason and scientific method work. Uh, Kritik der reinen Vernunft, the critique of pure reason in 1781. And he's born early in the century, he's born in 1724. But he also, because of where he was in Germany, he has friends who become critics of the rationalist approach. And, and, and one of whom we'll mention in a moment, uh, and become significant players in this kind of counter-rationalist critique of Enlightenment assumptions. But Kant walks head on into uh, the crisis in philosophy, which was introduced by David Hume, who basically argued uh, a kind of radical empir empiricism that denied the idea that you could really know for sure much about the world. Um, what you knew was known the way a scientist knows stuff. You knew it from probabilities and the like, and, and you really couldn't get inside what things were made of and, and how they were structured internally. So traditional philosophy after Hume was left in this, in this 
uh, desert. And Immanuel Kant, as he claimed himself, uh, was awakened from his slumber, in his own terms, by Hume's skepticism, saying, if I'm going to make any defense of knowing anything about the universe that's really solid, I've got to answer Hume. And so he tries to rescue the situation by rejecting what he regarded as a false dichotomy between classical theories of knowledge and modern skepticism. He says, I, I think I see a way around this. And his way around it was thus. He first distinguishes what he, he calls uh, phenomena, appearances, things as they appear to us subjectively, uh, which uh, can be intuited and things in themselves, the ding an sich, as he calls them, which can never be fully known. What a thing really, really, really is. He says, I, okay, I'll concede this much to you. What a thing really, really, really is, we can't know. But there's all sorts of stuff about it that Hume's pure empiricism doesn't admit. And he says, and I'll tell you how you get to that. We can know something about things through the structure of phenomena. He flips the classical relationship of intellect and object. He argues that the mind is not a tabula rasa. It's not a blank slate. But rather, the mind shapes our experience of the world. So in other words, space and time, which we think of as dimensions of um, the out there, the world, he says are really categories of the mind. And, and those categories, spatial geometry and time, structure experience. So I can know something about the world because it's the mind shaping the way we view things. I can't fully intuit what's behind all of that, but I can know something that has to be true about it because of the way, because it's the mind shaping it. Up to now, it has been assumed that all our cognition must conform to the objects. Okay, what we know is like taken from the objects out there but all attempts to find out something about them a priori through concepts that would extend our cognition have on this presupposition come to nothing. Okay, the traditional method doesn't make it. Hence, let us once try whether we do not get further with the problems of metaphysics by assuming that the objects must conform to our cognition, which would agree better with the requested possibility of an a priori cognition of them which is to establish something about objects before they are given to us. This would be just like the first thoughts of Copernicus, who, when he did not make good progress in the explanation of the celestial motions, if he assumed that the entire celestial host revolved around the observer, tried to see if he might not have greater success if he made the observer re revolve and, and the, let the stars at rest. So he says, let's just flip it on its head. Let's say we know something about things because the mind has shaped our perception of those things. And, and what comes through is trustable. If not fully revealing, it tells us something about those things. So then he uses this framework as a foundation for a moral philosophy and he had a tremendous influence on the 19th and 20th century, um, on phenomenology, on, on idealism, on all sorts of things. But, and the reason I mention him here is that uh, even he, even, even rationalism has moved uh, much more in the direction of a, this kind of subjective, framing of the world. The world is seen through us, our minds, and our emotive uh, personhoods, 
through our personalities, if you will. And that is what romanticism is really about. It's it's the world as, as we have made it. It's the world of us. It's the world of our inside. And to the degree that it tells us something about the outside, that's all well and good. But it's really it really starts and is rooted by the in here. Now, a friend of Kant's, a man named Johann Georg Hamann, became who, who is known as the Magus of the North, was a friend of Kant. And he's the guy who actually introduced Kant to the works of Hume and Rousseau. His departure from typical Enlightenment ideas, and here I'm now talking about the counter Enlightenment as philosophical positions, not just as artistic positions, not just the product of the novelist and the graphic artist and the musician, if you will. Uh, but but there were those who wanted to lay down a, a philosophical counterpoint to Enlightenment philosophy. And he gets there. It's triggered for him first by the fact that he has a religious or mystical experience, after he, which he develops this foundation for philosophical romanticism. He distrusts, once he has this his mystical moment, he immediately distrusts, distrusts reason as a kind of imperious um, bully as it's been promoted by uh, Enlightenment theorists. Because of the intensely subjective character of religious faith, he came to view the entire world in terms of local and particular experience and developed a deep mistrust of generalizations. Don't talk to me about humanity and human nature. I see the world through my concrete incredibly hyper particular lens and and so must all of you so while the late 17th century early enlightenment figure pierre bale made the great claim reason is the supreme tribunal and one which judges in the last resort and without appeal everything that is placed before it haman responds and he was doing it directly to this quote by the way what is this reason with its universality, its infallibility, exuberant certainty and obviousness? An ends rationis, a rational thing, a stuffed dummy, which the howling superstition of our unreason endows with divine attributes. Reality is in the particular, not into the abstracted universal, human life, human language, and human culture defy universal characterizations. Every time you give me the generality, I will give you the particular contradictions, the, the sore thumbs, if you will, the anomalies. Uh, the universe exists in the anomalies. So rationalism for him is an idolatry of sorts that lulls a man into sleepwalking with assurance through life. A man who with infinite sagacity, reflection, coherence, talks, acts, executes perilous enterprises, and does this with greater assurance of touch than he would or could do it if his eyes were even a little open. So the rational man walks confidently, not knowing what he is not seeing through a, a world that is the trees, not the forest. The particulars and the anomalies. A, a follower of his, a protege of his, uh, Johann Gottfried Herder, 
a very famous um, theorist who actually becomes the foundational thinker behind the Sturm und Drang movement. He's the one who, who for among other things, pushes for the use of German in literature, not the, the, the universal languages. It's return to the language of your folk, as he, as, as he mentions to his uh, young friend Goethe, spew out the ugly slime of the same. Speak German, oh you German. Uh, let's get back to the national sources. Let's get back to our birthrights. Let's get back to our, our tribal origins. So nationalism and this idea of origins, which will grow into its ugly side as well, will inform many of the, the revolutions that are about to happen uh, after the French Revolution. Be, uh, and they owe as much, these other revolutions, to the rise of nationalist and romantic nationalist sentiment as they, as they do to enlightenment ideas about the, re the rearrangement of social and, and governmental institutions. So Herder, who works as a literary critic and a philologist, a man who studies language and its origins, became the foundation for a philosophy of national character, a philosophy of national character that had spiritual, linguistic, artistic, and political elements, and was at the very heart of the Romantic movement. A poet is the creator of the nation around him. He gives them a world to see and has their souls in his hand to lead them to that world. So he looked to ancient sagas and mythology, and this is the period for the rebirth of mythology and the searching for mythological roots in each and every civilization for evidence of the particular national character. It isn't that this, the talk isn't here as it was in the, for the figures, contemporary figures, as many of these people, like the, the, the Scottish enlightenment figures talking about universal human nature and looking across tribal civilizations for this common human element. Here's a movement that's looking for the particular expressions of each of these societies about what they would regard as national character. The new importance in this period of Norse Eddas, German folk songs and, and, and fairy tales, the Brothers Grimm, Celtic myths, was because of their function as origin stories of the folk. Again, Bring on Wagner's Ring, bring on Dvorak's Slavonic dances, bring on Verdi's Nabucodonosor. Um, let's go back to who we are. Let's find out who we are. And so in Weimar, uh, between 1772 and 1805, the city of Weimar hosted an artistic and cultural movement that was inspired by Herder and that synthesized romantic and classical elements. So, so the great poets of this movement were Goethe and, and Schiller. They were the, the central luminaries, but, but they were surrounded. And here we have Goethe, here we have Schiller. Here are many other recognizable figures in this painting of Weimar's courtyard of the muses from the period. And it's an art movement that is a nationalist movement, that is a romantic intellectual movement that has a, a vision and a fairly integrated vision about, about the primacy of nature and the human heart and, and the growth of, the, of a human family in time and of the human individual in, in, in 
all of these contexts standing as an indictment of uh, enlightenment concepts of human nature uh, as, as a universal synthesis uh, of the uh, values of modern civilization over the superstitious medieval dark age impulses of, of earlier times. Uh, here are these movements that, that just value other things. Now it's in this period uh, after 1772 that Goethe wrote uh, his one of his masterpieces and, 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 and the one, uh, there were two, Faust, of course, you, you know of, but, but Wilhelm Meister, which is a novel of, of self-realization, of coming of age with the Germans in this period, well, everybody in this period, but they, they, they took the German term Bildungsroman. It, it's, it's the coming of age story. We, we find it all through 19th century literature. It's, it's Wilhelm Meister and it's uh, Stendhal's The Sentimental Education. And, it, and ultimately it, it's Tom Sawyer. Um, or Huck Finn, when we when we get much later into the 19th century, but it's a it's it's not just a coming of age. It's it's a coming to enlightenment of a sort. It's a coming into authenticity. It's a coming. It's the self education of the person, despite the social context around him. It's how a person hacks himself into authenticity in a world that tries to form him. It's the individual against the society. It's, it's, um, it's the modern novel. It's the world wants you to be something other than you are. And the educational systems want you to be something other than you are. If you are going to be truly educated, if you are going to, to somehow become true to yourself and find yourself, you will find, it's all of existential literature, you will find yourself through uh, this inward journey and there are literary artifacts of it just all over the 19th century, but beginning with Wilhelm Meister and the uh, late 18th century. And so uh, I want to leave you with some images. Uh, we've been talking about the significance of nature. I took this much later painting. This is the, uh, an Albert Bierstadt from California in the 1860s. But again, what you will find, and by the way, I had, you know, 5,000 images I could have chosen to make this point. But the idea that nature is living, majestic, ineffable, an organism, not a machine. It's ineffable. It's, it's, it's inexpressible. It's indefinable. It's beyond category. It is sublime. And, and, we have Henry David Thoreau speaking in his walks around uh, the, 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 the famous pond. We have, we have all sorts of writers and all sorts of creators and images, and of course, all sorts of you know, composers of symphonies. When they turn to the topic of nature, its power, its its ability to stimulate awe, its sense of movement, its intimation of the divine is present um, everywhere one looks. And our idealization of nature is really based on this as we come into the 21st century and the sense that this 
predates or precedes, not predates, precedes uh, anything that humans have done to make an improvement upon it. So here we are among the Sierra Nevada. So nature is the sublime. And of course, nature is a landscape of the heart. It's, an, it's idealized as a subjective experience. It is more than a place. It is home. And, and the constables of the early 19th century, all those wonderful farm scenes that you get from John Constable, this one from uh, Wevin Hope Park, is uh, suggestive of, of that. This is an apprenting of nature. This is a painting of home. And home is where the heart lives. And this is before the real estate industry decided that things uh, that we used to call houses no longer exist. Only homes exist as they try to, to sell you on the, the, the validity of your own interior heart. Uh, they don't want to sell you a house. They want to sell you a home. And Constable was telling you what home was. And it, on one hand, it's nature. It is, it is a park. It's got humans in the scene. It's got animals in the scene. They are domestic. They are supportive. They are not threatening. They are where you live. And isn't it wonderful? And in, and in the great dark satanic mills of Birmingham and London, uh, don't you miss home out in the Suffolk countryside? And finally, as our last image, I wanted to actually um, take an image from a, a romantic garden and the one from Stourhead in Wiltshire. I have visited this one, by the way. If, if you ever have the opportunity, this is such a magical place. But, and here we have all the elements. We have, we have the, 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 the buildings that refer and the, the constructs that refer to the past, but we have nature and its moment of change. Um, and we have that sense of home and peace uh, and sublime interiority that the Romantic movement wished to express and convey. So what we have as our first foray into counter-enlightenment is this idea that, that it's the emotional side subjective side of human experience that, that is going to become the important voice uh, in answer to enlightenment rationalist claims. And, um, and it's more in line, as they would point out, with the natural elements that we have lost contact with is what they're suggesting. And that's why there's always this, this kind of nostalgia. It's not just natural, but it's, it's a nostalgic view of, of, of the world. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about the French Revolution a lot and, and, and the rise of, of radical theories and conservative theories. And those conservative theories will be another type of counter enlightenment to the degree that the French Revolution was arguably uh, in, a, in an extreme form, a, an expression of the enlightenment assumption that reason gets to remake civil society as it needs to and as it thinks it ought to by the dictates of logic. Um, to that degree, the, the conservative the development of modern conservatism is a response to the Enlightenment saying, no, no, you've got that wrong. Reason, reason 
is going to lead us astray. We're going to have to trust other elements in human experience, some of which are going to overlap with these romantic elements. And we'll see how political conservatism and romanticism actually have some similar roots in common. Anyhow, with that said, I am going to stop the share and I will unpin myself. And here you folks are. Um, any Yeah, I have, I have a question. Please. All right. What do the anthropologists today say about this kind of Emil's Rousseauian state of nature? Modern anthropologists? Or, yeah, or, or yes, both the anthropologists, when they, I don't know whether they were anthropologists at the time, or, but certainly modern anthropologists today. Well, the modern, the, the modern, Anthropologists try to avoid the whole question by saying uh, it's value free. Okay. So, so there is no primitive. There is the the, the idea of of there being higher and lower civilization is a. Uh, a bias read onto the situation. I think mo a lot of anthropology, modern anthropology would try to argue. Uh, they're, ab they're about documenting differences, not higher and lower differences. Yeah, I, okay, I can, I can easily buy that, but I was wondering about this kind of peaceful, stable, you know, Rousseauian state of nature. Oh, I don't think anybody, that's clearly idealized. Okay. I mean, I mean, but even even within the movement itself at the time, there would be people pointing out that it's okay. It's, you know, okay. in fact, in fact, once even somebody like Herder would have to admit it that once you start arguing or examining particular individual circumstance, all idealizations fall. Right. And right. in the face of that, and that every every idealization. Is is an overstatement of the case. I'll, I'll tell you something that um, back in the days when I found myself doing university lectures, the um, you notice I have this sort of staccato stop and start yes. uh, rhythm to speaking. It's because what I'm about to say is being reviewed, like. In your head. <laughs> a heartbeat, yeah, a heartbeat before I say it. And I realized once upon a time when I was doing this a lot every day kind of thing, what I realized was what I'm about to say is as false as it is true. Right. And and is as much an overstatement. Uh, and, and, and I got to the position as a student myself as the student involved. Um, I developed the habit when I was reading something of making my synthetic argument for what this book is about or what it's doing or what this author is doing. And, and as I made that, formed that opinion, I, I said, I taught myself the discipline of seeing if the absolute converse of mm -hmm. that was also true. Was also defensible. Right, right. <laughs> Could I argue against what I was just going to argue for? And was that right. as good? Or did it show throw any light on, on you know, what I was first going to say? And, and so that's when I realized the only value I had in a classroom was to show them how I worked as a student, not how they should work as students. Mm -hmm. but I, I, show, I would show them my starts and my stops. You know, I, I, and I would often say, you know, I was just about to say this, and I suppose if left to my druthers and I get to think about it for another 15 minutes, I'd still probably say this, but I would also warn you mm -hmm. that I could say the opposite. Right. <laughs> and, 
and, and not maybe not the contradictory opposite, but but put another light on it or, sure. or another lens over it. You know, yeah. it's like Photoshop. There are a million things I can do this to this photo without utterly distorting the original image. Right. You know, anyhow, that was for uh, Dr. Geltman there. Okay. That reference. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Lou, Lou yeah. if, I, if I can say. So, I mean, what you really, what it seems to me is that we're saying that there are two and possibly more ways of uh, looking or explaining the same thing. And um, you're opening up the possibility for your own uh, debating society. <laughs> Uh, and that's sort of complicated. Um, wouldn't you rather say, well, here, here, here's one way of looking at it. Here's an opposing view. And is there a possible third point of view? Instead of, you know, trying to get everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's often. You make it simple, you know, I mean, just. I, yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. It's just that when, when I, to come up with the second step, and your steps, the one that said, here's another way. I often had to hesitatingly say, well, maybe the first way isn't true. It was an, an interstep. The interstep would say, maybe the first one isn't true. And then I would then say, maybe there's another way. You know? Okay, well, well, let me say this about that. <laughs> well, here's my critique of pure reason. We, okay. are human. we are humans and we want to have an idea of what we think, of what we believe. And so if you're going to say, well, on the other hand, like the Tevye thing, you know, it's this, but on the other hand, and if you, I think that as human beings, reason isn't enough. We also want to know what we believe or what we think. It's good to have an open mind and be skeptical. Is there another way to see it? But not to resolve those two paradoxes is very difficult just as a person. You want to know, I think people want to know what they think. And eventually they try to, you know, as human beings, I don't know, like I said, this is the critique of pure reason. Um, you you want to come to some place that you can say, this is, you know, what I think. Not necessarily what I believe, but, you know, this is where, this is where I feel comfortable. I'm one of those guys. You know, not one of these guys. I don't know. Does that make yeah, sense? But, but uh, Susan, what I think Lou was trying to point out is that uh, can we ever be sure of of what of what we think and what is true? I'm not. I'm not equating that with the present day um, uh, fantasy of what is the truth uh, that some some would believe. Um, Whatever you whatever you think is wrong, and whatever I think is true, and I'm not confusing it with that. Well, we're, ent I, we're entering a deep dark forest here. I know, <laughs> I know. And, and you started it. <laughs> <laughs> but but Susan's absolutely right. You know, in this modern day, you have to make decisions, and what do you base those decisions on? Uh, and you have conflicting ideas. What's really odd now is how do you judge the worth of a decision that you've made? Is outcomes really the way? Or, <laughs> and of course, we always talk about, you know, the inconvenience of, you know, uh, other effects, you know, unintended consequences, collateral damage. So, I mean, it's a, it's a modern question also, Susan, you know, you do have to know what you think, but you're gonna be wrong. Or are you? I, I want to point out. Know. I want to point out that that both Fred and Susan are psychologists. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Susan. <laughs> Hi, Fred. Well, I was actually going to say this really has to do with the, his concept of uh, amour de soi or amour propre, because you can feel good about yourself based on what other people, like you said, the consequences and what other people you know, the impact on uh, on the society of what that will decide whether you're right. It'll also decide whether you feel good about yourself. Um, it's really hard to disconnect yourself from, from consequences in the society. It's funny, Lou, that you said that. Well, uh, of course, Lou <laughs> isn't going to teach about utilitarianism yet. That's a much big one. Two more courses ahead. I actually, we did that in, in one other one. 
one other class from a couple of years ago, but I might get back there again. <laughs> so next week is um, the finale, okay? And this was fun. I will see you folks. Ciao. Bye.